Before we jump into actual IPv4 design, let's get a quick refresher about the components of IPv4 design. That way we know when we jump into it, how we can take this knowledge and apply it to a real enterprise campus. Let's get going. Do you remember the first time you learned IPv4 subnetting? Maybe you were going for your Network Plus or your CCNA. That was kind of an overwhelming experience, wasn't it? The IPv4 subnetting is not a particularly simple thing. You get into the binary and how it all works. Before we actually jump into how we should take that knowledge and apply it to a real production environment, we should take a step back and just refresh ourselves on some of the key components about the IPv4 subnetting, RFC 19 addresses, and even NAT before we move on, because these are all core components to how we design an actual network. And if any of that stresses you out about subnetting, don't feel bad. That only makes you a red-blooded network engineer. Recently, I was on my own YouTube channel taking a BGP CCIE practice exam, and I'm sitting there doing this on the video, kind of subnetting on my own fingers. It's just how it works, and it's just part of it. So let's dive into a quick refresher on IPv4 networks before we jump into how we actually design them. First things first, we need to talk about the classful boundaries. And when you think of a class A address, what's the subnet that comes to your head? Probably almost all of you are thinking about the 10 subnet, right? And this is a big talking point already out of the gate. The 10 subnet is a class A address, but guess what? It is not the only class A address. And that's kind of the misnomer. That's kind of the mistake that we make as network engineers is we forget that these classes are actually large ranges of addresses that are set up based on the bits that are in play here. For instance, class A is really anything 0000, 0, 0, 0 through 120, I guess it's technically 26, but you, we should put 127 here because 127 is a reserved address. What is really going on here is when we actually write our subnet out in binary, the class A addresses always begin with a zero. They call this the higher order bit. So if I had a subnet that was 99.0.0.1, we know that this is a class A address, first of all, because it fits in the range of 0 to 127, but I could also tell it's a class A address because if I wrote this out in binary, the very first bit right here is going to be 0. Now this is where the trend start to emerge is when we go to class B. The class B high order bit, guess what, this is going to be 1 then zero. The first two bits are always going to be one then zero. And the subsequent result here is that this is a range of 128 dot whatever, x dot x dot x, x to 191 dot whatever. And again, when you think of class B addresses, you're probably thinking of that 172.x.0.0 slash 12 subnet, which is 172.16 through 31.255.255. We move on to class C, and this is where you see the trend emerge even further. The higher order bits now are 110. Can you guess what class D is going to be? It's going to be 1110. Then class E is going to be 1111. You could kind of get the trend of how this works. 0, then 10, then 110, then 1110, then 1111. Class C is the one that we all grew up knowing about because this is going to be our 192 section. We've got 192.x.x.x through 223.x.x.x. And again, we think about the Class C private address of 192.168, don't we? Because this is the one that, you know, comes out of the box when we buy a device from Best Buy. Now, the interesting things about Class A through C is these are typically unicast Addresses, of course, the final bit or the final host address is going to be a broadcast address. As soon as we jump down into class D, now we're talking about multicast addresses. Class D was specifically reserved for the multicast situation. When we had one server that needed to reach many different clients, we didn't want to initiate a unique session for every single one of them with unicast addressing. This could overwhelm the network as well as maybe the CPU of this particular server. So we created the one too many addressing scheme, which was class D. And that's the entire point of multicast networking. Now, of course, we have a lot of multicast content coming up, so we're not going to dive into how multicast works too much because we've got dedicated skills coming up to that as part of the design playlist here. But, it's but it is important that we actually set up and recognize what a multicast address actually looks like. Multicast subnetting ranges from 224.x.x.x to 239 maxed out 255.255.255. I'm just going to write XXX here. 
And lastly, Class E is actually reserved for experimental networking, which is going to be 240 through 255, but not, of course, the broadcast address. We're going to cut this off at 255, 255.254, because the 255, all 255s, is the maxed out all devices broadcast address. So these are some important talking points right now is considering these are called classful boundaries. When we see a slash 8, that is going to be the class A boundary. We're only talking about slash 8 networks. When we see the slash 12 in class B, we're talking about the class B classful boundary. When we see the slash 16 here in class C, we're talking about the class C classful boundary. And then of course we go into multicast and experimental after that. These are important because nine times out of 10, actually let me, let me clear up the screen for a moment here so we can talk about this. When you see 10, how often do you see 10.0.0 slash eight out there in the real world? You don't. We always take this class full boundary of a slash eight and we break it down into smaller usable pieces because what we're really looking at here is millions of addresses. When we use all of the different combinations of addressing right here, we could do 10.1, then one through 255, then again, one through 255. This goes on millions and millions and millions of times. In the class B section, we get up to 65,535 addresses. When we get to class C and we're actually looking at maybe these slash 24s, now we've whittled it down to 250 five addresses. And then we also have to keep in mind that we need to reserve one address for our gateway and one address for our broadcast. So what you just heard me say was a pretty big talking point that we need to clarify and make sure you understand for the real world versus an exam environment. There is a difference between allocating addresses for users and endpoints and allocating addresses for host. Take a moment and think about a slash 24 CIDR notated subnet address, maybe like 192.168.1.0 slash 24. Within that slash 24, there are a total of 256 addresses. That's the zero through the 255. Now, when we take that slash 24, we know immediately that two of those are not usable. The zero, which is the network address, and the 255, which is the broadcast address. That leaves 254 usable host addresses. So in an exam environment, what you need to think about is, are they asking for hosts or are they asking for endpoints and users? Because that's different. Then in the real world, when we've got this 254 usable IP addresses, we immediately know that one of those, maybe the dot one or the dot 254 is going to be allocated for a router. So the remainder is what we can use for endpoints or our users. So I wanted to clarify that before we went on any further. And if you hear me talking about this throughout the rest of this content, you need to pay attention to whether or not we're talking about hosts or if we're talking about end users. I always like to take one step further and go ahead and allocate that address for my default gateway and router now. That way I know how many endpoints I can actually have on my network. So the 255 that we're looking at here is really something more like 253. And this is absolutely critical for you to keep in mind. Look, look right here, right here, me in the eyes. It is absolutely critical for you to keep in mind when you're designing your network that you have to factor in the broadcast address as well as possibly an address for the gateway. So when you see a slash 24, your head shouldn't go to 255 available addresses. It should go to 253 available addresses if you're factoring the gateway into that. You can only have 253 computers on this network if you want them to be able to communicate to a gateway. So we've talked about class A networks and we've even talked about how it's easy to confuse the class A, B, and C networks with the RFC 1918 private addresses. That's 10, that's 172, 16 through 31, and then 192.168. whatever that all make up our private addressing. And then this becomes another critical talking point. Again, we've heard this a few times, as this always gets brought up, but we have exhausted all of the IPv4 addressing schemes available to us. That's why we had to create RFC 1918 in the private addresses. That way we could assign these addresses to any of our devices and any of our sites in a private manner. But these addresses right here are not available on the internet, and that's where we have to bring NAT or PAT into play. If I have 253 privately addressed devices in my enterprise and they need to reach out to the internet, 
but the internet doesn't accept 192.168s or 172.16s or 10s. How then do we get these 253 devices on the internet? And that's where we bring network address translation into play. As our devices talk to the router, the router will translate their internal address into a publicly routable address, something like 44.32.99.1. And I just totally made that address up. If that's your address, I'm sorry, but there you go. This is just a randomly class A addressed public address. The router maintains session knowledge or where a network address translation has taken place from within this network so that way when reply traffic comes back, it gets translated as it comes back into the network. So why are we talking about all of this? Why does this really matter? Here's the thing. We can't just throw subnets at our network and then hope that everything's going to work just fine. It takes careful planning and understanding about the components of each one of these octets and what they can actually represent within our network. And then we have to consider things about where traffic gets translated through our network, where it can get natted and where it can get padded. This even becomes an issue when we go through mergers and acquisitions and then two companies are using the same address space. All of this stuff matters when it comes to designing a network solution. So over the coming nuggets, what we're going to talk about is how to take this classful information and maybe break it down into smaller subnets and then actually design each one of those octets to mean something. That's the entire point of network design. So that's been just a refresher on our IPv4 skills. I hope this has been informative for you and I'd like to thank you for viewing.